Hello friends, welcome back to the James Lawrence Allcott channel. In this episode of The Fallout, we will reveal to you which metric Liverpool are rock bottom of, and it's an important one, in the Premier League this season and why it is really, really hurting him. This weekend was a round of fixtures that either strengthened some teams' reputations or severely damaged the reputations of others and some individuals especially as well. And we will dive into all of that in this week's episode of the fallout if you are new to the channel and you find value in this episode do me a favor hit the like button and the subscribe button we're going to look at which teams held good accounts of themselves and which teams have embarrassed themselves this weekend we'll also let you know if something's happening at man united and of course we'll talk about how miggy almiron is the reason i love football I mean, let's be honest, is there a better place to start than Newcastle United 4, Aston Villa 0, an XG of 3.44 to 0.37. Ouch, Aston Villa fans. Maybe you want to click off now if you're an Aston Villa round, actually. But first of all, can anyone stop this Newcastle United side? Another beautiful performance from Newcastle sweeping aside Aston Villa 4-0. Now, what was so impressive about this win was how balanced of a performance it was from top to bottom. You know, we see in the XG how well Newcastle United were able to not only create chances for themselves, but also starve Aston Villa's forwards of any kind of service. Tactically, this was really, really interesting to see how Newcastle stopped Villa from creating anything, to be honest. Aston Villa only had three shots and a big but this is a team that last week won 4-0 by the way and a big part of that was Newcastle preventing the Villa fullbacks from getting forwards now last week against Brentford we saw Ashley Young we spoke about it on the fallout he was able to get forward well and and support Leon Bailey but with the threat that Almiron and Trippier posed it limited Young from supporting the attack the same was true on the other side with Joe Linton Joe Linton is that what we're going with now Apologies, shutting down Matty Cash, who actually came off as well. So Ashley Young had to hop over to the right-hand side. Let's talk about that man, Miggy Almiron. I, I want to call him Miggy, okay? Can we do Hey, Miggy. Hey, Miggy. He's great. He's great. Him and Trippier are a match made in heaven. We spoke about Trippier last week, so if you're a Newcastle fan and you haven't seen that one, go check it out. This partnership terrorised Ashley Young all afternoon with Almiron coming inside with Trippier holding the width. It often turned Ashley Young inside out at times and gave both Newcastle players a lot of space to work with. With, with Bailey not tracking back, to be honest, it meant that Newcastle consistently had those overloads in the final third. And... Almiron, you know, with the goals that he's scoring right now, the big thing is that because of that width that Trippier provides, Almiron is essentially playing as a centre forward. There were two perfect examples of this. The first being the build up to Callum Wilson's second goal, where Almiron and Trippier, they combine pretty effortlessly, but it was it was easy, let's be honest. The second example of this is for Almiron's goal. Here we have two screenshots that demonstrate how the pair's movements confused Ashley Young. It enabled Almiron to work the ball into space and to get the shot off unchallenged. But that said, you know, we can dive into the tactics a little bit too long. This is why I love football. Stories like this. And I think literally 99% of people, as well as Jack Grealish, owe Almiron an apology. I did a video on who deserved an apology. And I kind of had to give Joe Linton one last apology just to kind of put the full stop on it. But Almiron, the story, the fact that he just kept his head down, kept moving forward, gently started to get more and more confidence, got himself into the right areas. There was never a question over his work rate. There was a question over his quality. And again, Eddie Howe deserves huge, huge credit. And it's amazing what a couple of little drops, I mean, not little drops, big drops, I guess, of quality can lead to for the rest of it. There is that ripple effect of you know, having Trippier alongside him, he he just gives him such freedom. Add to that a couple of, you know, ones that come off your chest or your bum or whatever it is. And then all of a sudden you're a world beater. It's great. It's great. This is, you know, people get annoyed about predictions and going, how could you say this? How could you say that? But football will always slap you in the face. And being slapped in the face by a smiling Almiron is, is what it's all about. And uh, Alma, Miggy, I'm sorry, man. You're absolutely killing it. Keep it going. From an Aston Villa perspective, their fans have the right to feel let down by their side. The defending was woeful at times, not only being able to deal with movement in the six-yard box and ball watching. That was the root cause of Callum Wilson's second goal, and it was a distinct lack of concentration. I think the World Cup is actually going to save a few teams because 
it's going to get really, really dark for teams if, if they if they weren't able to have that break and to sort of regroup. And Aston Villa are one that really, really need to re- regroup because it was no way near good enough. You know, this is something, that lack of concentration, that's something that Unai Emery is going to have to iron out ASAP. That is what he is about as well. I was uh, listening to a podcast and talk about uh, Joaquim, I think you call him, um, at Real Betis or Valencia. I can't remember where it was, but he was saying how no one likes football like Emery and they watched so many videos that he ran out of popcorn. So this guy is diligent to say the very least. Now he doesn't officially start his job until Tuesday. So hopefully this is, you know, just that that reset that they were talking about and they could just get past these next two games. I know Villa fans will be looking forward to it as well. And then, start again because it was woeful. Speaking of a walloping, Brighton 4, Chelsea 1, the XG 2.44 to 1.36. Graham Potter must learn. He's got to learn pretty quick because people will turn on him, I'm telling you. We did say they will eat him alive. I like him. I want him to do well, sort of. I mean, I'm a QPR fan, but look, he has to admit now that I mean, first of all, he got this one wrong. You know, playing a back three with no wing backs has served him relatively well, generally. But And it was even better, of course, at Brighton early on this season. However, it severely hindered his Chelsea side against Brighton. Overloads out wide were the key to Brighton's success and Chelsea's downfall. The average positions tell a real story here. The back three of Chelsea were horrendously exposed time and time again. Thiago Silva really, really looking all alone at times. Chalabar and Cucurella having to move out wide at times to defend, which left a lot of space in behind. And Brighton utilised a lot of second runner movement to hurt Chelsea, and it worked so, so well. The screenshot here shows how Brighton's movement out wide punished Chelsea. So this is from the third goal they scored, with Matoma making the initial run. We'll talk about Matoma in a second, because he's been great for them. He so makes that initial run into the centre, and it allows Estupinian to make the secondary run in behind. Matoma's movement in this game it was really important as he often took up central areas which meant that Chalabar wasn't really able to fully commit to defending the space and Matoma would often drift out wide as well for the first phase of play before moving centrally to create space out wide and it was incredibly effective for Brighton I really like Matoma as a player he feels like he's the latest on the conveyor belt of Brighton sort of superstars that they sort of plucked from nowhere and he's not got a lot of praise this season but he's getting more and more minutes and every time I watch him he just brings a a positivity with his play his close control is exceptional and it makes him very very enjoyable to watch and hard to defend against another tactical aspect uh, that I really enjoyed from Brighton was their pressing. Brighton's pressing made the Chelsea defence disjointed from the midfield and it massively hindered their ability to move the ball through the thirds and find any kind of rhythm at all. Here's one for the comments. Does how did you take Graham Potter's post-match interview? Do you, do you feel like he needs to grow up or do you think he showed an element of strength? I think bottom line for me is that he did bite. You know, in the post-match interview, Graham Potter, he sort of... Did he lash out? Let me know. I want to know how you feel about it, especially Chelsea fans. Would you have wanted him to just sort of shrug his shoulders? Because he kind of, he kind of went, oh, I've got nothing to apologise for because the Brighton fans were, they were at him. You know, they were booing. And from the start of the match... And he said he didn't do anything wrong by leaving the club. He's got nothing to say sorry for and he left him in a good place. Is that something that, it's so tough, isn't it? But you are dragged through the mud by your post-match interviews. Were you disappointed with the fact that he bit? Because I think he did bite. And is that something you're slightly concerned about as the pressure builds? Because it will build. Because they've got a very, very big game coming up this week against Arsenal. And... It's one where Potter's going to kind of need to ring the changes. It's going to be at home. Could be a really, really tasty one if Chelsea go bold with their tactics. And it has the making of a really, really good game for the neutrals. But hopefully, Graham Potter can kind of keep that even keel because that's what's got him to this point. Liverpool 1, Leeds United 2, the XG 1.71 to Liverpool, 1.77 to Leeds, who deserved it. The big question is, why can't Liverpool defend? And we spoke about a stat at the start of the video. Here it comes. So Liverpool have the lowest tackle success rate, 43.6%, out of all of the clubs in the Premier League. The worst at tackling in terms of success rate out of the entire league. 1 to 20, they are the worst. That is crazy stuff. 19 points they've given away this 
this season. I think 22 over the entirety of last season. And it's led, this lack of uh, ability to sort of get out of the opposition and win your tackles means that they're having very little control in their defensive third. And it's an insight into why they have struggled so much at the back this season. Leeds winner demonstrated how much Liverpool sit off nowadays and also showed that they are... They are, they're somewhat complacent when it comes to defending. I think the Man City game was different. They had that energy for that one. But in these games against the teams that they they should be beating, they're struggling. Not only was Willy Nonto able to wriggle out of a one versus three scenario, but Somerville for the goal was also, he was given what felt like an age to take a touch and poke home. I mean, maybe I'm being a little bit harsh because I guess he's in the penalty area and he does take it a little bit quickly. But that tenacity, that suffocation that comes with Liverpool is just not there at this moment in time. The question from a Liverpool perspective must be, are these players getting complacent defensively? You know, Van Dijk seems a shadow of his previous self and he seems like he's mentally slowed down that little bit. Some people talking about he's maybe checked out with the World Cup. And I think that is so close now. There's going to be a lot of players that are just kind of going, oh, look, please, I just want to play in this World Cup. And it's it's getting tense. And that, that maybe is playing a part in all of this. Um but it does feel like he's mentally slowed down and he's failing to read the game as quickly as he once did. Klopp even said in his post-match that the defending for the second goal was a problem. Obviously, the defending for the first goal was atrocious, but it's one of those things, right? So they're able to identify the problem, but they simply can't prevent it from happening every single week at this moment in time. This is a side that has won all there is to win. And there's only a certain amount of formation changes that you go through before you start to question where the player's head's at. I'd love to know what you guys think in the comments down below. Is it a mental thing by this point? Because you have tried a few different ways of of getting back to your best and the the lack of conviction defensively reeks of a lack of confidence and self-belief but how do you get over that you know do Liverpool just need to get to the World Cup is this another team a bit like Villa and try and regroup because then that might allow that tactical side to to really really be polished because that's the problem it is incessant when you're Liverpool it's game after game after game and if you haven't got everything sorted out, like they have done in previous years, trying to make corrections on the move is pretty tricky. On to Leeds. There were 69 days between Leeds' last Premier League win and their win at Anfield. They looked excellent going forward and moved the ball brilliantly in transitions, especially out wide. I thought Christensen was excellent against Liverpool. He was often a spare man out wide for Leeds and Liverpool's narrowness that we spoke about last week on the fallout, allowing him to move into advanced positions unchallenged. This meant that He was able to provide crosses into the box. And on another day, Leeds could have scored quite a few more chances, as you saw from that XG and then beating Liverpool at home. Very rare that that ever happens Um, because they were able to create all these chances out wide. The narrowness of Liverpool is something we talked about, as I said. And this graphic, uh, which is courtesy of JK Football Analytics, he sent that to me. Thank you, mate. And if you do see interesting stuff, let me know at James Alcott on Twitter. Uh, That's at at underscore JKDS underscore. in this graphic, you, you can see how Rasmus Christensen virtually had the right flank to himself. And it was a key source of creation, uh, but also, you know, an outball for Leeds as well. The lack of pressing out wide made it really, really easy for Leeds to move the ball up the pitch. Final thing to say, and we spoke about it last week, the pressure that was on Jesse Marsh. I thought it was pretty revealing the way that the likes of uh, Rocha and um, Christensen celebrated with him those are the only two that I saw in terms of the pictures that we saw when it came to Jesse Marsh but I think you've got a lot of players that care a lot about that guy and uh, hopefully that will keep Leeds in good stead great victory for them Bournemouth 2 Tottenham 3 the XG 0.54 for Bournemouth 2.09 but do not be fooled I know I talk about XG a lot Tottenham were lucky Despite what the score and the XG numbers suggest, I think Tottenham were actually really lucky to come away with the win here, and I'm going to tell you why. There were severe organisational issues at the back for Spurs, and that may have been a symptom of not having Romero or Dyer in the starting lineup. Bournemouth aren't a side that are going to attack in sustained waves of pressure, nor are they a side that are going to commit many men forward. Therefore, Marking the danger men in transition is one of the few defensive duties that Spurs would have had. And this is why the amount of space that Kiefer Moore had in this transition is criminal defending when it comes to the first goal for Spurs. Davison Sanchez is at fault for this, in my opinion, because 
He's trying to cover the space rather than the man. That's like criminal stuff. And when it comes to the second goal, I thought that there was another very poor piece of defending by Spurs. When Kiefer Moore, who's an old school target man, he's going to be at his most effective when area balls are played into the box. And Bournemouth had a 44% accuracy for their crosses, which is very, very high. Spurs, for example, only had 19% accuracy. Therefore, stopping crosses at source... That's got to be one of the priorities for Spurs. and But they failed to do so and they were punished by Bournemouth who, you know, a couple of defeats, of course, are disappointing, but I think there's still positives there for them. And in Kiefer Moore, getting those couples of goal, couple of goals, Solanke's been in good form as well. It's those two players and the physicality of this Bournemouth side that's going to get them over the line this year. And it's games against Tottenham that aren't, you know, they're a free hit to a point. So not something that they want to get too gutted about. But I guess the other problem, of course, is the fact that they conceded the goals that they did. Um, but... You know, you're playing against a quality quality team. Maybe they can be that little bit better with the ball, you know. But these defensive mistakes from Spurs, they're a little bit schoolboy. And you don't expect that from a Conte side. The fact that Conte didn't even flinch when their 93rd minute winner went in, it demonstrated how he knew that they were very lucky to come away with three points. And it shows his dissatisfaction with the overall performance. I know he spoke about character and I think you want to utilise the high of a last minute win, but... There, there were only a few positives and one positive, you know, despite the poor defending, it's got to be Ryan Sessegnon. And Sessegnon, is he what England need right now? You know, he had a decent game against Bournemouth playing as a left wing back for the majority of the game. He came away um, with a very, very well taken goal and was also really, really tidy in possession, 84% pass accuracy. You know, he's got a goal in him. You know, the potential criticism is usually over his defending ability. But in this game, he individually was all right, winning five of his eight ground duels. I think that defensive side is obviously improving under Antonio Conte. He can play on both sides as well and you know he's got that goal in him he's probably in better form than Chilwell right now but I think it probably is going to come just a little bit too soon but he's certainly a a future competitive England starter because we knew he had the pedigree at Fulham and the goals that he scored and he's now getting to that point where he's, he's ready for England Ready for dessert? Well, here are the sweet, sweet gunners to provide. Arsenal 5, Nottingham Forest, nil. XG of 2.25 to 0.43. No cracks here. Arsenal doing what they should be doing, but doing it with real aplomb, which is a word that is only used um, in football punditry, it seems. Arsenal puffed their chests out and they really turned on the style in this one. This was a, it was just a really complete performance by those sweet, sweet gunners again. And tactically, this game was a bit of a mismatch with Arsenal walking all over Forest and punishing them on several occasions. So let's have a look at how Arsenal demolished Forest. The average positions give you a good insight into why Arsenal was so dominant throughout the 90 minutes. Forest sat so deep. It was so timid and and they also didn't apply any pressure to Thomas Partey which is a big big mistake Partey had a total of 120 it's just 126 touches and when you have that many touches it almost takes away from the performance because Forrest like barely really like laying a glove on him and he made 19 passes into the final third 19 like time after time he was able to thread a ball through the lines and party being able to sort of dictate the match. Uh, it just allowed for the forward players to take up higher positions on the pitch, as you can see. And on several occasions, this was a big part of how they were able to total 24 shots alongside five big chances. It was a statement victory for Arsenal. They kept the ball extremely well and they also kept transitions to an absolute minimum. This meant that Forrest found it really, really hard to find our need. Especially with Saliba acting as a sweeper, it limited any space in behind for Forrest to find the Nigerian. Many are going to give Forrest a pass on this match as no one is expecting them to beat Arsenal. However... I do have a problem with how easy it was for Arsenal. Almost from the first minute, it was clear that Partey was having a lot of time and making things happen. And Steve Cooper didn't address this. And he just sort of simply allowed it to happen over and over again. Like, I do agree that Arsenal win this match like nine times out of ten, but they made it so, so easy for them. And that is unacceptable. And Steve Cooper made some comments where he suggested that, you know, it work rate, 
it's the bare minimum and they're not truly getting that. It's it's a wobbly time for Nottingham Forest, despite it being Arsenal. I get that they're great, but there was a lack of desire there. It wasn't it wasn't pretty. Question for Man United fans. Is something happening here? Man United won West Ham nil actually of 1.24 to 1.08. And the thing that's really happening here. Ericsson and Bruno are just, first of all, crucial. That cross from Ericsson is just gorgeous. And there's not much to take from the game really apart, but but that's kind of the beauty of this game. But the thing that I did not think I would be saying at this moment in time was that Man United's midfield, it continues to be a shining light for this team. And it, that pays tribute to the work that Ten Hag has done since arriving at Old Trafford and how smart the move was to get Ericsson through the door. At, at times like when he arrived, I was sort of thinking, mm, come on, he's a better fit at Tottenham. But he's just been so useful in so many different ways for this team. That midfield duo of Bruno and Ericsson, it's becoming a real joy to watch this season with both players on the same wavelength and both with a a detailed appreciation of each other's game, really. For the first time in what feels like forever, Man United have a midfield capable of breaking lines with their passes rather than having sideways pass merchants like they did previously. And this, that just paints such a picture against West Ham Ericsson made 15 passes into the final third 15 and Casemiro made seven so to put that into context of how valuable this is to this team Pogba was the leader for Man United for passes into the final third per 90 last season with 6.6 whilst McTominay and Fred they were averaging 4.26 and 5.82 So this ability to move the ball into dangerous areas, it's not only beneficial in making chances happen, but it also means that Man United are able to be purposeful with their attacks and have a clear method of ball progression, something that we haven't been able to say about Man United for a very long time. Last season, they they were nowhere near this. They didn't have that real style or that method to their uh, creation. Bruno and Eriksson as a pair, if you watch a Man United game, one thing that just becomes abundantly clear is how well these two play together. They often stay really, really close together as you can see by their their heat maps for the game. And for the goal, they also combine brilliantly, which is something we've also not seen at Man United for some time. Bruno's got a mate, and I think that's that's really good. Whereas previously, he's kind of been either an individual that needs to sort of do it on his own shoulders or someone that's looked a little bit isolated prior to Ericsson's arrival. Another player that I'm so delighted for is Marcus Rashford. People are completely hammering him slating him saying he's finished finished saying he's not capable and he's in form at the perfect time you know this goal and it's a bullet header you know like I say the cross is just yum but Rashford's goal it marked his 100th goal for Man United and it was excellently taken you forget that he is six foot two we've never seen him sort of display his aerial potential that much but He's getting into central areas as much as possible. That's a very clear directive you can see from Ten Hag. And you're seeing something from that. And he's now got the confidence. He's always been a very technically brilliant player. And so the finishing ability has always been there. It's been a confidence thing. And that goal, it was a textbook header arrowed into the net. Under Ten Hag, we're starting to see Marcus Rashford pop up in more dangerous areas, in the box, and he's going to continue profiting from this. Let's talk West Ham. It was West Ham's third 1-0 away defeat of the season. Despite creating a few good chances, they just can't seem to score at this moment in time. I think one potential issue I could see in their team is maybe that Flynn Downs it playing in a 10 position. Well, I like him as a player. I just, I don't think, I don't think he's what West Ham need in the hole. Now, you've got to understand that, um, Against Man United, he's been put in there to be industrious, to make it hard for them. However, I think West Ham needs someone that can carry the ball at 10. Otherwise, they seem to pass the ball to Ben Rama and just hope he can create. Like, I understand that Paqueta is injured, but maybe you start Lanzini or Fornals in that 10 role. Fornals, we know, works really, really hard for the team as well. It would lessen the pressure on Ben Rama to be that sole creator. Also, David Moyes, he waited till the 77th minute to sub downs for Fornals, and that just felt a little bit late, in my opinion. I think that's something we're going to stay on on top of when it comes to the fallout and generally football these days is that you've got to make changes and there's no reason to make them late anymore so that was a critique from me if i may say so myself and i do say so myself 
Thanks guys for watching. I hope you've enjoyed yourself. If you want to check out more, we're going to be doing so much content with the World Cup coming up. World Cup previews on their way. Uh, I'm going to be recording them this week and a World Cup guide. So this is the place for you. If you enjoyed the video, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button as well, and be ready for when the next one drops. See you soon. With Almer and coming inside. <laughs>